And uh, here at the Seattle Science Foundation at uh, the Swedish Neuroscience Institute, we take this occasion uh, to celebrate the academic accomplishments of our outgoing class of fellows. And this has been an amazing year in this regard. Yet again, every one of the fellows has taken on one or more subjects and pursued them to a high degree of diligence and put their own individual stamp on the inside parts. Ben, do we have the slides available? Right, great. So this is the main facade of our um, home at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute on Cherry Hill. And again, as you can see in the opening sequence, I was still wearing a mask. So two and a half years into this, uh, we're still wearing masks. We're still practicing social distancing. And again, I want to uh, really highlight the amazing professionalism of our fellows and all of the healthcare workers who we get to work with here at Swedish Cherry Hill and the Swedish system who managed to adapt and uh, do a great job uh, working through these problems and uh, maintaining a great deal of hygiene. Uh, that said, again, life goes on and within social distancing uh, restraints, we still manage uh, to uh, have the fellowship part, that is the togetherness and camaraderie part, highlighted uh, here um, with some of our visiting professors. And again, when apropos, uh, gathering together and uh, sharing the positive experiences of this fellowship part as a lifelong, hopefully positive commemoration of uh, friendship and good food. And again, this has been a uh, amazing thing. There's always this kind of a lottery of life of who's getting together in the center two of our German fellows. And on the left, uh, on the left side, you'll see Yev and the right side, Jerry. They'll give their presentations in a second. And yes, while they work hard, um, they really do like the camaraderie part also. And gathering together with former fellows on the left in the leather jacket is Dr. Ishak, who is now the chief of spine at the University of Heidelberg, who came in for a surprise visit and some lectures and guidance. And again, here's uh, the uh, general team of our clinical care management on the clinic side uh, gathering together at a celebration. So we do work our fellows very hard, and not only in surgery, but they have to do schlepping and uh, carrying duties, as you can see here. So no task is beyond them. But the main focus is obviously to turn these uh, bright young colleagues into superb clinicians who exercise due diligence. On the left-hand side, you see Dr. Pratt exercising robotic uh, planning skills um, uh, on the computer for a complex spine reconstruction. On the right side, you see Dr. Tataran um, uh, educating a, another fellow a trainee on minimally invasive surgeries. The mask is up riding a little bit low, though, Zach. And again, we practice social distancing whilst we're at work uh, in diligent and compliant fashion, uh, whilst we're exploring the latest in technologies. Here's uh, Dr. Oskuyan teaching Dr. Robinson and uh, Dr. Fravert on how to do prone position far lateral procedures, and we're very happy to be on the forefront of this. And our uh, SSF talks continued on the left side, the spine trivia night, which this year we did not win. We are only second. And on the right side, uh, practicing cadaver skills with Dr. Oskuyan, the chief of our spine service. And uh, this is one of our views of the spine arthroplasty course. The little advertisement uh, in October will have our, I think, fourth or fifth annual uh, course uh, to participating. And this December, we have our spine trauma course again here with Dr. Daly and Dr. Arabi from uh, University of Maryland. So we thank uh, our SSF team. Uh, they're amazingly spirited uh, people with Gary on the bottom left and our phenomenal team with Alexis, Angela, Linda, and Ben, who really make this all happen, an amazingly small team. But uh, the uh, biggest uh, thank you is to our SSF and SNI fellows, who are an incredible crowd. On the back left, you see my partner, Dr. Hart, and on the front right, uh, Dr. Skuyan and Dr. Amir Abdul-Jabbar was not visible. And of course, our spiritus uh, sanctai, the main leader of us is uh, Lindsay. She's in the front right here, and uh, she keeps us all going. And a special cordial thank you for this uh, outgoing year and her incessant efforts at keeping us together and keeping us uh, in good shape. So thank you all for your interest in uh, SSF talks. And who's the first out of the shoot? That is Dr. Fravert. You just saw a slide of him. Uh, here's Dr. Fravert uh, from Palo Alto, California, undergrad UC Berkeley, medical school uh, upstate New York, and UCLA David Geffen School, and he's going to Houston Methodist to be an academic spine surgeon. He'll be followed by Dr. Pratt uh, talking about Houston. He's uh, from Houston, Texas, uh, graduated from Oklahoma. 
uh, went to the University of Oklahoma and uh, then trained in his residency in neurosurgery at the University of Maryland. And he's going to the University of Texas Medical Branch, uh, Galveston, uh, near Houston. Um, he'll be followed by Dr. Robinson, originally from Ohio, undergrad at Concord, uh, did his residency in medical school in Ohio. And he dared to go to the West Coast. He's going to UPMC, so Pittsburgh. But before that, he's going to spend six months in LA uh, practicing minimally invasive surgery. He'll be followed by Dr. Zach Tataran, Ottawa, Canada. Um, and he went to Colgate. Um, he uh, had a great distinguished East Coast career again, ICANN, McMaster, and then Boston uh, will be his next destination. Um, and he'll be an academic spine surgeon in Boston. And uh, that'll be the lineup for today. So without much further ado, congratulations to this group. And Yev will take the lead, followed in the sequence as mentioned. Yev, are you keyed up? Mm -hmm. Great. I'll get out of your way. All right. Uh, can we uh, pull up the slides? Fantastic. All right. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit more dry than Dr. Chapman's presentation. Uh, I'll be discussing one of the, the projects that I was able to bring to completion um, uh, over the course of this fellowship uh, over the last year. Uh, this title looks specifically at uh, the ability to trend uh, preoperative CT densitometry uh, to predict uh, proximal pathology in long segment spinal fusion. Uh, I have no, uh, no relevant disclosures at present to this project. Um, as a little bit of background, uh, we all know that uh, PJK and PJF are pretty common complications after, uh, after spinal fusion. That, uh, that scan on the right there is, is unfortunately uh, all too frequently seen after you know, these, these fairly large investments in terms of time and resources. Um, you know, as I mentioned, these are these are quite common uh, complications. Uh, frequently, they they occur uh, very rapidly after surgery. You know, some studies show that over over half of these uh, complications will happen within three months uh, of a long segment spinal fusion. Uh, these are also very expensive issues. Uh, you know, uh, this doesn't account for current inflation rates, but they're approximately forty to fifty thousand dollars per uh, uh, per occurrence uh, for all of the care that the patients need uh, when PJK or PJF occur. Um, we also know that low, low bone mineral density has been associated with uh, increased rates of PJK and PJF. Uh, and historically, uh, DEXA has been the gold standard to, uh, to assess bone mineral density. Uh, unfortunately, DEXA is logistically complicated, uh, not necessarily very accurate for spine for, for many reasons that I uh, won't go into here. Um, and as a result of this, uh, CT densitometry, especially over the last uh, five to 10 years, uh, has been emerging as, uh, as an alternate option and is becoming you know, reasonably established in the literature. Uh, so uh, I created a study that uh, took CT densitometry to the next level. Um, we, we performed a retrospective review uh, using CT densitometry to, uh, to trend uh, bone density uh, uh, preoperatively uh, for these patients undergoing a long segment of spinal fusion. Uh, we identified uh, slightly over 1,000 patients uh, undergoing fusions that were greater than or equal to five levels. Uh, 608 of those patients had uh, thoracolumbar uh, upper instrumented level. Uh, and then uh, 110 patients were identified that had sufficient imaging for uh, for trend analysis. Um, as a little bit of subdivision, um, 36 patients had completely comprehensive imaging with two preoperative time points and immediate postoperative imaging as well as adequate follow-up. Uh, and 44 patients uh, were um, uh, a very homogeneous patient popula population, T8, T9, and T10 uh, UIVs uh, with fusion to pelvis uh, with at least one good preoperative scan and one immediate postoperative scan that we could use to trend uh, bone mineral density as well as uh, uh, adequate follow-up, uh, and there were nine patients that were shared between those two cohorts. Um, uh, this, this is just to demonstrate the, you know, the, the method for a single pass measurement of uh, CT, dump, CT densitometry of the uh, UIV and UIV plus one, uh, and then subsequently uh, you know, radiographic analysis was performed uh, to, uh, to assess PJK and PJF. Uh, and the results were uh, were pretty striking. So um, uh, this is uh, this is the comprehensive patient cohort, not the 
uh, not the uh, homogeneous uh, surgical cohort, uh, and that uh, both the UIV and the UIV plus one um, uh, preoperative uh, decline uh, in bone density, especially high velocity decline, where uh, where there was a uh, you know rapid and, and punctuated decrease in bone density, was significantly predictive of proximal junctional failure. Uh, at the UIV, uh, it was uh, not uh, statistically significantly predictive of proximal jun junctional kyphosis. Uh, at the UIV plus one, uh, it was. Um, uh, when we uh, take a look at the uh, homogeneous population of, of patients that only had a T8, 9, or 10 um, uh, to pelvis fusion and look at only at the UIV plus one uh, for obvious reasons because you can't look at the UIV uh, postoperatively in this patient in these patients as it's uh, you know bearing hardware. Uh, both uh, both PJK uh, and PJF were uh, significantly predicted by uh, declining uh, uh, bone density in that uh, preoperative and immediate postoperative period. Uh, and then when we perform pool analysis, the uh, the difference becomes even more stark and, and uh, highly significant. Uh, interestingly, uh, I at least with uh, with the patient population that uh, uh, that uh, I used in this study, uh, even though uh, absolute uh, preoperative uh, bone mineral density, um, as assessed by CT, uh, was uh, was approaching significance, it actually was not not quite significant. And uh, we think that that's just an issue of uh, of N. Uh, if we included, you know, if we had just a few more patients to include in the study, uh, you know, this this would begin to correspond with. Uh, you know, uh, previously published studies, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it suggests that the trend is actually a stronger predictor than the absolute value of bone density in the preoperative period. Um, so there are a few things that we can uh, we can draw from this. Uh, it looks like uh, bone mineral density, as assessed by CT densitometry, uh, correlates. Uh, pretty strongly with and likely predicts uh, proximal pathology. Uh, it seems that uh, trending bone density by CT uh, potentially creates a new opportunity for patient optimization. Uh, and critically, many patients, uh, you know, 36 patients in this study, uh, already have adequate imaging to perform trend analysis. Uh, and, and even for the ones that don't, it's really just a matter of obtaining an additional preoperative CT, uh, which is certainly more, uh, uh, more simple uh, logistically as compared to getting an additional DEXA scan or even DEXA scan at all. Um, so, uh, in terms of future prospects, uh, I think uh, uh, certainly this is uh, this is an area that bears uh, that might bear fruit for a prospective study. Uh, it may also be amenable to uh, automation, and it may eventually lead both to reduced uh, DEXA utilization and improved patient outcomes. And the you know the, the future that we're striving for uh, for this study is that you have you know some some no name surgeon who who decides to do a a T10 to pelvis, and then our friendly uh, EMR. Uh, Runs the analysis automatically and suggests that maybe uh, a T8 terminus is better given the uh, given the observed uh, preoperative uh, bone mineral density trend uh, at that area. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll uh, I'll wrap up and uh, leave things open to questions and discussion. Quite brilliant, uh, Dr. Freiberg. Thank you. First of all, applause. <laughs> Brilliant, not only in terms of the execution, but also in uh, light of the fact that you resisted my skepticism at the <laughs> beginning of the academic year when I was very doubtful about this and uh, against uh, these um, concerns, you really formulated a very clear, concise, clinically meaningful question and pursued it to a high degree of uh, uh, relevance for us. I'm going to ask my partner, Dr. Hart, do you have a microphone, uh, Bob? So you're one of the senior members of the International Spine Study Group, ISSG, that has uh, kind of dominated the deformity world. How do you see this kind of an insight playing into the future? Because bone density has been largely uh, correlated to uh, DEXA scans, and DEXA scans, as Dr. Favre said, are unyieldy, uh, highly subject to variations, and uh, uh, are expensive and just not trending, actually. So this would be a trend test. Yeah, I, well, I think this is going to be much more relevant than, uh, than a DEXA for the, all the reasons we've already talked about. Um, you know, my practice is still to use DEXA um, and, um, um, and treat it if they're osteoporotic. It's, it's frustrating because a lot of times we get uh, an intermediate value of osteopenia and we can't get uh, medical optimization a lot of times authorized through insurers for those patients and the medical optimization is very expensive. But this is a great, uh, great study. Congratulations, Jeb. Oh, and uh, it's a great question. It's still one of the uh, 
un fully, not fully resolved uh, complications and not fully avoided. And I just had one of my own recently that came up with neurologic deficit as a result of a, a proximal junctional fracture. So. Uh, it's it's an important question. So thanks for this contribution. So let me ask you, uh, take on the role of the skeptic uh, academician. Uh, how sure are we that the um, kilovolt that was used in the source, um, uh, the radiation source was consistent in 250 kV uh, A and B? What would you attribute the positive trend line to? Were there active measures taken in those patients that had a positive net gain on HU uh, that we could kind of causally identify and then maybe pursue more systematically? Yeah, those are excellent questions. So, so first I'll address the, the heterogeneity in imaging. Uh, that's actually something that I, I didn't present here, but I, uh, I tracked that for all of the, all of the patients. Um, it, it, it's, not, it's not the KV, it's the KVP that's relevant based on the, based on the literature to, as far as I'm aware. And uh, there, um, there's certainly some variability. So only patients that, uh, that had consistent KVP uh, at the time points were included in this study. Uh, I identified, it, you know, it actually was a major issue. There were only a handful of patients that I had to exclude, uh, where um, different time points were measured on significantly different uh, um, uh, imaging regimens, where the KVP varied varied uh, dramatically. Um, uh, in terms of uh, your uh, your second question, the positive so, trend responders, the responders. Yeah. So uh, I was kind of surprised to see that. I think uh, almost certainly to some extent were. We're just measuring the patients that are making lifestyle changes. Uh, you know, inevitably these patients are seen preoperatively, and and they get the routine recommendations to eat a healthier diet, exercise more, and I, I think uh, uh, some of the patients that are improving, um, especially over the long term, uh, are are just the patients that are they're following instructions. Um, I think more more critically, uh, it's. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to, the, uh, to some of the data here. Um, I think really it's the, it's the patients that have a, a market and rapid decline uh, that are the, um, uh, the red flags, more so than the patients that are uh, increasing. Because even some of those patients you can see there at the UIV plus one, some of them still experience PJK. It's really the patients that are declining rapidly that, that should raise red flags for, for PJF. Uh, so I think there are some things that co-vary here, and certainly further studies could uh, uh, could demonstrate that, but uh, in, in isolation, this seems to be a, a valuable trend nonetheless. Well, I hope that we will have uh, routine reporting by radiologists before we get to HAL uh, uh, viewing us and telling us what to do, that we'll have a consistent reporting by radiologists on bone densities, uh, at least for spine imaging, if not for routine chest, abdomen, pelvis, CTs in the future. You, you know, I don't think we're that far from HAL. Uh, auto segmentation already exists. Uh, there are multiple multiple uh, companies in this space that that are uh, already on the verge of this technology. I think within within five to ten years, this is going to be something that's that's easily achievable. Rod? The other thing, yeah, what's interesting uh, in your data, I think w men and women were both, right? I mean, yeah, uh, and sorry, I just in the interest yeah. of time, I didn't, uh, I didn't present all the demographic data, but it was, it was uh, well balanced between. Uh, so I think historically, and, you know, we all, all the family docs order, you know, um, DEXAs on only females mm -hmm. in their sixties, and and I'm, I think it's as prevalent, if not more in men. So that's another important thing I, I hope you highlight and discuss in the paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, that's going to make it into yeah. the final. Uh, yeah, men are actually only half as prevalent, but uh, twice as uh, uh, they have twice as high mortality than mm -hmm. females. So it's actually a, a very good point you raise. All right. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. Before we go with Dr. Pratt, we have a two-year fellow, um, Dr. Jared Cook, who's going to talk about something in deformity surgeries, realm, and that is multi-rod constructs. That's been a hot-button topic, and um, uh, Dr. Cook took it upon himself to kind of uh, take a deeper dive as one of his projects in his two-year stay with us um, to see what we actually really know about multi-rod constructs. So, Dr. Cook. <laughs> well, in short, no. Um, so the. Uh, the project that uh, that I'm working on it's a systematic review. Uh, since we have a few systematic reviews in uh, you know in this series of presentations, we can you know kind of go over what exactly that is. Uh, so I don't have any disclosures relevant to literally anything. Um, so 
what is a systematic review? So it's um, a specific type of literature review that is uh, supposed to be methodical, transparent. Um, you will see exactly what the study methodology is, the inclusion ex exclusion criteria, um, what the search criteria uh, were that were used, um, how we assess the studies and uh, how the data was extracted and synthesized so all of this um, can be uh, reproducible. That's the, uh, the main thing. Anybody should be able to use these methods and reproduce our results. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen plenty of literature reviews. So here's, you know, kind of the difference between the, uh, the systematic review and the literature review. For systematic reviews, it's a uh, very precise question, um, you know, using, uh, using exact search terms, uh, data extraction tool. Um, there will uh, often only be a small number of papers that meet inclusion criteria, uh, often you know, 10 or less, um, as in uh, the one I'm about to show you. And, um, the uh, uh, PRISMA guidelines uh, are often used, and there's a, a chart for that. It's the flow chart that you generally see where, uh, you know, papers start to get uh, whittled down to the ones that are eventually uh, reviewed, and then recommendations are made based on those papers, as opposed to a literature review where there's a broad, less specific question, and, um, you know, the, uh, the reviewer often uh, has a lot a lot of uh, influence over the results just based on their interpretation. They can have 50, 100, or more papers um, involved in that. Um, and this is more, it's, it's more descriptive, um, you know, as opposed to using uh, hard data. So um, then the, uh, you know, other, you know, thing is, uh, you know, meta-analysis. Um, so with the systematic review, we'll uh, collect and summarize the, uh, the evidence that fits into our eligibility criteria um, and answer that research question that we have. Um, the quality will vary based on the quality of the studies that go into this. Um, as, uh, as we often see where if your studies are, you know, level three, level four evidence, that's, you know, what you're getting out of your systematic review. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as I said, there are reproducible methods. With the meta-analysis, you're, um, you know, using st uh, statistical methods to summarize the studies. Um, it's, uh, it's more precise um, and, uh, um, you know, provides an objective evaluation. Um, of the findings. So for, um, you know, what I was looking at, we're looking at uh, multi-rod constructs, which, um, you know, it's kind of becoming more, uh, you know, more of a hot topic. And so, you know, we want to know in the literature, what are the indications that are currently being used for, uh, for multi-rod constructs as, you know, pictured over here. Um, uh, to, we wanted to compare uh, standard two-rod constructs to multi-rod constructs. Um, and look at specific outcome measures, um, review the usage of, uh, you know, multi-rod and, and all the other terms that are, uh, that are you know, kind of used interchangeably out there. And, um, you know, importantly, there just haven't been any systematic reviews on this. So the PRISMA methodology was used, um, uh, search the PubMed and OVID uh, uh, databases, and um, a two-person assessment, um, you know, was uh, used to uh, select the, uh, the eligible studies with a third person as a tiebreaker, and um, uh, eventually this uh, this came down to uh, to ten papers. So the inclusion criteria we're looking at only adult patients. We're looking at only spinal fusion, so none of the non-fusion um, uh, procedures. Uh, human subjects only. Um, uh, you know the. Uh, things that we're looking at, adult smile deformity, degenerative, uh, you know, scoliosis, um, uh, neuromuscular scoliosis, uh, adult uh, CP. Um, posterior only constructs, we, uh, we're not looking at anterior. Um, uh, comparative cohort studies and uh, minimum of two year follow up. So then the exclusion criteria kind of is just, you know, the opposite of that. So um, it, importantly, excluding finite, ele uh, finite element uh, studies, in vitro studies, cadaveric, et cetera. Um, so these are the, uh, the search terms that were, uh, were used in order to do this, um, and uh, the asterisk will just kind of fill in uh, the rest of the word. Um, so for our, um, uh, for our method to work with a, a statistician, we're looking at um, uh, the, uh, uh, the indication being used for, uh, for the multi-rod constructs. Um, the number of levels that are uh, that are being fused when uh, when doing this, the number of rods that are being used when doing this, are we dealing with three, four, five, six rods? Um, uh, the uh, 
areas of the spine, um, and then also looking at you know things like does this increase the the operative time, the blood loss? Uh, is there a a benefit um, as far as pseudoarthrosis goes, rod fractures, uh, PJK, PJF, um, increased infection risk with more hardware? Um, does it help or you know hurt as far as uh, leading to revision surgery? And so here's what that um, Prisma diagram uh, looks like. So uh, initially uh, found 2,754 studies. Then after um, you know the after the automation, uh, we were uh, able to exclude um, uh, 1,789. And then you see when we, uh, after retrieving studies, the ones that were assessed for eligibility, so you know, reading through abstracts and such, um, 965, but eventually it was 10 that actually met those, uh, those criteria, mostly because a lot of these are, uh, are you know, only single arm studies or uh, just case series. Um, so these were the studies that were uh, included that you know met eligibility criteria, and um, so what we uh, what we see is that the the earliest one that actually had uh, you know two arms to uh, the study of the uh, multi rod and and uh, you know standard dual rod constructs um, the earliest is uh, 2014 uh, you know whereas the earliest you know write up generally was um, you know was known to be 2008 uh, but um, as far as you know, what's, uh, what we can use for comparison, um, this is what fits in. Uh, so we can see evolving interest in our um, in that uh, top graph. So in 2014, there was one study. In 2021, there were five. Um, so you know, this is uh, you know looking like it's become a more uh, a topic more of interest to uh, to people. And then as far as terminology goes, these are uh, really just all the terms that um, you know that uh, I was. You know, able to gather from basically any study that um, you know that I read, and here are the terms that are actually being used with uh, the most frequency. Although uh, we see that they're uh, not actually um, you know clearly defined. So, um, so the the trends that we see so far, um, you know, we'll have the uh, the final numbers actually probably pretty soon. Um, the trends are the multi rod contracts are mostly being used for adult spinal deformity. Um, the thoracic to pelvis fusions, one of the uh, studies was thoracic to sacrum, um, but it, it is not really using, being used in, um, uh, in shorter constructs. And uh, stability around osteotomies, the, the PSOs, the um, you know, uh, multi-level um, uh, multi posterior uh, osteotomies, and um, you know, the, the numbers that we see so far, it shows that it's uh, you know a decreased rate of uh, rod fracture you know in you know in this you know population um, associated with less revision surgery and uh, but only actually similar rates of uh, PJK and PJF and you know at this point uh, you know qualitatively we can you know we can you know say those things the uh, statistical analysis is pending so we need to see if those are uh, statistically significant um, but. Uh, you know, I think we're actually uh, only a couple weeks away from you know being completely done, um, and uh, so look for it in final publication. We'll uh, we'll see what the stats say. Great, thank you. So it's uh, a very interesting topic, uh, Bob. Uh, why do we have this mess of nomenclature? Is this uh, a lack of uh, academic discipline? Is this a lack of purpose in terms of uh, uh, identifying and understanding what these rods are supposed to do? How do we get here, and how do we get out of here? Well, um, yeah, um, I, I think mess is accurate. Uh, I, I guess I would say it's an emerging discipline, right? So the vocabulary has not yet standardized. Um, I use two words. One is satellite rod and the other is outrigger. Uh, outrigger rod. And uh, that's a very simple, you know, separation. But there are multiple constructs that don't fit really neatly into that description. A satellite rod is a rod that is not connected to the primary rods and an uh, outrigger rod is one that is connected uh, via cross links or dual head rods or dual head screws rather so this is another uh, i think emerging area very important topic um, and um, you know I, I i think that the multiple rods you know as, as your data is, is seeming to show do reduce the rate probably of non-union and eventual rod fracture at the very least, they delay the occurrence of that. And this is what I tell patients is we're going to use this 
uh, at the very least, it means that your construct should last longer because it's stronger. And if ultimately you need a revision, uh, we at least buy longer time before we have to uh, revise you for non-union. Yeah, I think I think calling it an, an you know emerging uh, field of study is very very accurate. I mean, they have um, you know that we have studies that have a very very short follow up time, and then we have studies that will show that uh, you know rod fracture um, is you know likely to occur you know five years or or more out. Um, but a lot of these studies are you know have twenty four months of follow up. Um, so I mean, we we just we need more data. Uh, so we just need more people to look at it. And I think that with, uh, with when the terminology is, you know, coming into play, um, you know, in order to have more, uh, you know, more robust, um, you know, data, uh, we kind of need to try to get on the on the same page um, so that we can uh, we can all find, um, you know, these studies that we're putting out there and and come up with a, a large patient population as a, as a whole to study. So, Jared, I have two comments. I think this is a great um, review project that you're doing. Um, I don't think there's a, enough long-term data uh, because my I can tell you my experience is I just revised a Charcot patient that was, I think it just delays your rod fracture. If you don't have a fusion, it doesn't matter if you have six, seven rods in there, eventually it's going to break. It's not going to break in two years, but it'll break in four years. So I think the long-term data is going to be important. Right. And then I also think going back to the fusion, you know, if you don't have, um, you put all this metal in there, bone graft's got to go somewhere. So I think that gets left out. But those are my two, I think, hopefully you'll touch in your review. Bony fusion is important. And regardless of how much metal you put in, if it doesn't fuse, it's going to break. Right. I mean, the, the metal is only there to support everything until that fusion. It's not meant to be, you know, the only thing that holds for a lifetime. So, yeah, you're, you're completely right. Well, I hope we have your study done soon because we have a classification project on the same topic coming out. All right. Thanks, Jared. Good job. <laughs> Dr. Nathan Pratt uh, from the neurosurgery program at the University of Maryland has been very active clinically. He's our administrative chief fellow. He did a terrific job. And um, he is going to talk about something that here in a uh, um, drug liberal state like Washington has been a major problem that's overlooked, and that is um, uh, IV drug abuse and hospital length of stay. He has uh, several projects, but this is one that, because of its acuity of uh, financial sanity uh, in healthcare, is uh, highly relevant. So thank you, Nathan, for your hard work, and uh, let's hear what you have to say. Thanks, Dr. Chapman. So. Uh, as, as Dr. Chapman told us, we're looking at the effects of intravenous drug abuse on inpatient length of stay in cases of de novo spinal infection. This is a topic that um, no one's ever looked at directly to see what the differences are for uh, patients who do or don't use IV drugs. Obviously, uh, as I think most people who practice healthcare know, spine infection has become a growing problem in the U.S. Uh, the incidence is somewhere around 1 to 20 to 1 in 100,000. Uh, persons per year uh, and has been increasing over the past few decades, particularly in Seattle. We'll see the numbers on that, or in the state of Washington, I should say. We'll see the numbers on that in just a moment. Um, but we're talking specifically about de novo spinal infections. Uh, it could be epidural abscess, osteomyelitis, osteodiscitis. Um, in this case, they all have a relatively high morbidity and mortality. Worldwide, the mortality rate varies somewhere around 5 to 16 percent. A lot of these patients that have this diagnosis are already very ill uh, with multiple comorbid conditions before they come in. Uh, over half of the patients never fully recover, whatever that might mean, whether they have some chronic uh, minor neurologic deficit or if they have chronic underlying infection um, or sequelae from their infection, renal disease, things like that from antibiotic treatments. Um, the patients all universally do require extended hospitalization, long-term patient follow outpatient follow-up. Uh, one of the reviews, I think I actually mentioned it next, uh, showed that for osteo, patients stayed in the hospital on average about 30 to 32 days. Um, and the annual cost in the U.S. is somewhere around $17 billion uh, to treat these, uh, the, the, these patients who uh, are acutely very ill. Um, so a quick look at, yeah, 32 days for osteo patients. This was an evidence-based review back from 2015, just a narrative review. Uh, and they distinguish between osteo and epidural abscess. We actually don't do that in our paper um, in the interest of just sort of using spinal infection, de novo spinal infection as a, a 
broad term rather than just looking at one versus the other. Um, these, these also didn't distinguish between whether these were de novo or post-op infections. Uh, they did find, which uh, makes sense, older patients with more comorbidities had higher mortality. Um, instrument effusion, thought to be relatively safe in de novo infections. This is a topic that's been studied here uh, in the past as well, and it influences the decision in terms of um, surgery for, for these patients, I think. Um, slightly more common for epidural abscesses. This is, again, uh, increasing incidence, but lower mortality over the past five decades, which makes sense for better treatments. The risk factors are sort of the obvious things you would think of, which we'll show in our study as well, IVDA, diabetes, uh, patients who are non-insured have a higher rate of epidural abscesses, uh, which again comes up in terms of patients who have intravenous drug abuse or homelessness or things like that. They have a very difficult time accessing medical care. Uh, this is a recent publication out of uh, Swedish that looked at um, the rise in spinal infection uh, in, in the state of Washington, correlating with this increase in uh, those who come in with the diagnosis of drug abuse or drug dependence, clearly a uh, uh, increase in terms of patients who are diagnosed as having drug dependence uh, over time uh, among those who are uh, infected, uh, having spinal infections. So this is clearly a connection between these two things um, that is uh, a target for how to treat these patients. Um, spine infection hospitalization. So there's multiple factors influencing susceptibility, medical comorbidities we spoke about, uh, bacteremia, remote infection, poor dentition, venous access, whether that be from IVDA or from a chronic indwelling catheter or something like that. Um, all these influence susceptibility to a spinal infection. IVDA patients are uniquely susceptible to severe infections. They fit, many of the risk factors fall right onto them. Most of them, not all, but a lot of those patients are uh, have housing deficiency. A lot of them live in, in substandard living conditions. They are frequently accessing their venous system uh, in a non-sterile fashion. And unfortunately, um, you know, the needle exchange programs, things like that have certainly helped, but um, there's only so much that can be done. Um, and then they have very poor access to healthcare services. A lot of these patients don't want to present uh, because they're worried about the consequences of the, the sort of criminal consequences of IVDA and things like this. They don't have uh, money, they don't have insurance, so um, they present very late uh, in, this, in this process. So our hypothesis was that IVDA would independently increase the length of hospitalization for these patients with de novo spinal infections. Uh, secondarily, that it would have a uh, greater impact than other risk factors uh, for spinal infection on, on length of stay. Uh, this is a retrospective cohort study. Uh, patients eight, over 18 years old, uh, treated in the last six years at Swedish, um, excluded patients who had, so if they'd had a decompressive surgery, um, but it was remote, we would include that in the de novo. Uh, like if it was over two years ago, at that area, we would include that. But if they'd had any sort of spinal fusion, the chances that there was some sort of biofilm or something that was clouding the picture was there. So we excluded those patients. Um, if they uh, had inconclusive imaging uh, that was not supported by clinical, this is a possible epidural abscess or a possible osteo, that then there's no clinical evidence for it or a, an infectious disease specialist says no, uh, then they would be excluded. And then prior infection at the index level, obviously we're not looking at repeated infections. We want to know what happens the first time uh, they become infected. Uh, and of note, um, we include both pyogenic and non-pyogenic infections, though uh, TB tends to be pretty uncommon uh, for our population. We have probably like four or five patients uh, with that diagnosis that are included in this analysis. Uh, so over that time period, we had 326 patients included from a data set that had 833 records. A lot of these were duplicates, patients who were admitted multiple times. Uh, a lot of them were non-spinal osteo because the uh, diagnosis codes, the ICD-10s, were inclusive uh, of a lot of diagnoses that were not uh, relevant. And then some of them were post-op infections that got excluded. Uh, the most important things to note here on the demographic section, the age, uh, 20 years of age difference between IVDA admit uh, and a patient who is non-IVDA. So very clearly, these patients are much younger. They have fewer medical comorbidities. Uh, except for uh, tobacco use disorder and um, uh, hepatitis C. Otherwise, uh, the, comor the comorbidities all lean 
sorry, toward the side of patients with uh, no IVDA, which makes sense. They have to have some sort of risk factor to get this uh, diagnosis. Very few people who are young and healthy uh, who don't have other risk factors will end up uh, uh, getting an epidural abscess or osteomyelitis. Uh, the other, oh, sorry, the other thing I forgot to point out, homelessness. Uh, about half of the patients who used intravenous drugs were either homeless or it's noted that their address is like a halfway house or uh, they say they live with a friend but they don't have a house of their own. A very frequent and again, very obvious problem uh, in terms of trying to help out these patients. Um, on average, the IVDA patients require 37 uh, days of inpatient care. Uh, versus 14.5 days uh, for non-IVDA patients. So a 23-day uh, difference in terms of hospitalization um, and that there, there is a sub-analysis that looked, this is, it turns out to be more like a 20-day once you factor in some of the uh, confounders, uh, which I don't have here, I don't have the final analysis for that yet. Um, but these patients also took almost twice as long uh, to present uh, after their symptoms occurred. Uh, you can see the time from symptom onset to presentation is underneath that. Now, there are a lot of missing data values there. Uh, spotty history is taken. Uh, some of that's estimation. What does several weeks mean? Um, we looked at that in a standard way, but um, you, know, you, you can only do so much. Uh, the, it, it depends on what the medical record will show you, whether or not that's significant or whether or not that's accurate, it's tough to know, but it would make sense. Um, they had a much higher rate of operation, which could have influenced their hospital stay. We need to do a sub-analysis on that to make sure that that's not the reason they were here longer, but it clearly they presented later had more severe illness and therefore uh, ended up with a higher rate of surgery. And I think there's a tendency uh, for us to operate on those folks thinking that they're not gonna clear the infection and follow up appropriately sometimes. So I, I don't know all the factors that may have fit into that. Um, and then there's similar numbers of readmissions, but we over half the patients uh, that were readmitted on the uh, IVDA side were admitted two or more times. So readmitted two or more times. So commonly just having problems with uh, reinfection or, or continued infection. The length of hospitalization nearly double for IVDA patients. There's no prior study looking at this. Uh, there are many factors that are probably contributing uh, access to care, late presentation. Uh, legal implications of IVDA, insufficient housing, and ability to disposition properly. So if patients have a PICC line, then the IV antibiotics, there's no way you're going to send them home with home health. They don't have a home and, you know, with their history, that's just not safe. Uh, a lot of them have multiple readmissions, like we said, two or more readmissions, uh, a lot of the time for the patients who needed to come back. Um, and some, one of the problems here that some of this is lost to follow up, some of them are probably seeing outside hospitals. We treat people from other states here too. And sometimes they go back to their home state when they're done. So sometimes we don't have that follow-up data. Uh, so there's obviously room uh, uh, where things can get missed there. Um, increasing incidence infection, longer hospital uh, stays. We have readmissions. The relevance to healthcare at large. I mean, I think that Dr. Chapman touched on it at the beginning. The recent pandemic really revealed uh, a lot of problems in terms of providing adequate care to patients. So limited resources exist. Um, and we need more beds to treat acutely ill patients. Uh, we can't move these patients who are otherwise stable into a uh, next setting of, of care, a, a rehabilitation or something like that. And so how do we treat people adequately but still move them through the system? We need a multi multidisciplinary team to treat these people properly, it's starting with the medicine doctors and infectious disease specialists who can do a great job prescribing the right antibiotics, but then you have to have great case managers and social workers who can get those resources for the patient. Rehabilitation centers are willing to take them, and I mean, we have to be available to, to treat surgically when necessary, but we're sort of the downstream effect here, um, whereas these sort of proximal portions of this that really make a difference in terms of how long they're in the hospital and how well they do. Um, so despite our robust findings, we know that this is a review. There's probably you know, missed diagnoses and things like that uh, that come from that. Um, despite that, I think that the uh, hospital, the data speaks for itself uh, in terms of the length of hospitalization and the need to find a way to better move these patients through the healthcare system. Our conclusions here, uh, just a few thoughts as we close out. Oral versus IV antibiotics, this would be a game changer if you could figure out a way to get these patients, uh, if there was a sufficiently penetrative oral antibiotic that would treat osteomyelitis specifically or um, epidural abscesses specifically that, that didn't require these patients to have a PICC line. 
that would be a game changer because then you don't have to worry about this position as much. You don't have to think about, oh, they can't send them out with a pick line. They have to sit here for three weeks. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, recurrent infections, how can we prevent that? Do they need to be on long-term preventive antibiotics? If they do, how are we going to do that? Uh, and then what do we do now? I, I think I mentioned it before, multidisciplinary approach. This is clearly dispo planning from the minute they come to the hospital. Some of this is far outside of my control and, and our control as surgeons, but you know, do we need to have specialized uh, centers available for these patients? Uh, they're clearly in need. The problem is that your resources, financial and otherwise, are just not there. Um, and so finding a way to provide better care for these patients you know, with uh, this multidisciplinary team is going to be necessary in the long run. Um, that's all I had. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Two quick questions, then we'll go on to Dr. Robinson. Uh, uh, do you have an estimate of the actual cost? So you had two indirect yeah. parameters of the length of stay and surgical versus non-surgical right. care as surrogates for care. But does that give you, and I know we don't have absolute dollars because that's a closely yeah. guarded proprietary I have charge. secret. Yeah, I have charge. Have charges, data. which means very little. Uh, yeah, and, and the problem is this very, there's no significant difference between the two groups. It's somewhere around $140,000 charge on average. Now, the problem is it probably doesn't capture everything that's getting charged. I don't know if it captures every physician fee that's in there, but within our system, that's what's listed. Um, and, and that's the range on that, the standard deviation on that was something like uh, 50 or $60,000. I mean, it's, it's highly variable. Some of these patients are in the hospital for as many as like 180 days. Obviously that's millions of dollars, right? And then some patients are in the hospital for three days and it's like, you know, ten or twenty thousand dollars. They just get a biopsy and they go home. Um, the published numbers from the review paper I mentioned uh, were about one hundred forty thousand dollars, somewhere roughly like one hundred forty, one hundred forty-three thousand dollars for patients who had uh, epidural abscesses. Uh, with a, if they had two or more medical comorbidities, uh, then they that number increased by about fifty thousand uh, dollars. So very clearly the charge at least, again, this is all charge capture, right? None of this is the actual cost of the hospital or to the healthcare, so we don't know what that is. Um, but in terms of charge, it definitely increases, in that case, by 33%, um, the more ill someone is, and they didn't specifically look at IBDA, though I, I imagine if we could really get all that data and really follow, get the follow-up and the um, uh, uh, readmission charges, I think that's where you would see the big increase in terms of cost or charge. Let me hit you with one more question, and that is um, the subject of dogma. Dogma in terms of IV antibiotics, you alluded mm -hmm. to that in a slide. There's this six-week uh, yep. kind of paradigm that has somehow um, entrenched itself in medical uh, non-science um, that our infectious disease doctors suggest for a really thorough antibiotic management of acute and severe infections of the musculoskeletal system. So how much does this dogma influence the length of stay versus surgical recovery or not having a secondary care facility? Yeah, I think that surgical recovery is minimal in that. I mean, if we were to do a, even a big surgery, even if we're doing a T10 to pelvis on a patient, that's a week-long hospitalization on average, maybe a little more depending on their age or comorbidities. Uh, the influence of the antibiotic treatment is immense because even on a patient who's insured and has a stable living situation, um, you still have to set up the case manager, social worker still has to set things up. Your insurance has to approve it. You have to get home health or infusion services, or you have to learn how to do it yourself. That medication has to be delivered to you. All of these things are influencing the length of stay way more than our operations are. Um, and, and that's really where it comes from. And, and you're right, this, there's this dogmatic approach at six weeks. Uh, I've seen, you know, reviews and things like that. People have evaluated non-inferiority of four weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks or whatever. Um, and I don't know how we've landed on six because I've seen four weeks be non-inferior to six. And it's a multiply of the magic number of three. It's that's exactly, exactly. The healing number. So. Great job. I hope you'll come to a conclusion with this in the very near future. This is of Draft's significant impact and interest. So thank Draft you, is Nathan. On the way. Great job. Thank you. So I'll ask Dr. Robinson to come to the podium. He's nicely dressed in a black jacket. And um, sometimes advances in medicine happen out of case observations, individual case observations, uh, from which a greater interest uh, derives. And again, we'll leave the subject of 
um, intravenous <coughs> drug abuse um, and go to something about genetic dis uh, 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 disformities. So achondroplasia. Thanks, Dr. Chapman. Uh, topic for today is a surgical intervention for thoracolumbar spinal stenosis and achondroplasia, and this is a systematic review. So for my objectives for today, I want to present a complex case of spinal pathology uh, that we witnessed here and I got to take part in uh, with an achondroplastic patient. Uh, describe the commonly encountered spinal pathology uh, and present uh, for the first time, I believe, uh, a surgical timeline of significant milestones associated with spine surgery and achondroplasia. I'll present my systematic review, evaluate the literature, and then discuss the treatment of our case. So our case presentation is a 51-year-old female with achondroplasia. Uh, she has worsening lower extremity weakness, low back pain, and trouble urinating. Uh, difficult to under interpret this value, but the PVR was around 100 cc's. Um, Difficult to find an exact number for an achondroplastic uh, patient, but uh, the patient is reporting difficulty urinating. Uh, they were seen a month ago with the exact same issue, and it was recommended to give them an epidural steroid injection and follow up. But for the past month, they've been un completely unable to ambulate. They have number numbness and tingling in their bilateral lowers from the waist down and using a walker while working at a movie theater, but now they can't even go to work because they can't stand. They currently do not have any myelopathic uh, symptoms in the cervical spine. Here you can see their right lower than left, uh, or right greater than left uh, weakness in the lower extremities with hyperreflexia and pathologic reflexes. Here you can see uh, the thoracic imaging where you can see uh, multi-level severe stenosis with cord signal change at 7, 8, and T, 10, 11. Uh, there's no significant thoracolumbar kyphosis, but there is significant facet hypertrophy and ossification of the ligamentum flavum that's contributing to their stenosis. And then here you can see their severe uh, degeneration and uh, stenosis of the lumbar spine. Again, multi-level stenosis, no uh, kyphosis with significant facet hypertrophy and complete canal occlusion at L45. So the surgical plan, but first, what does the literature tell us? And so an introduction into achondroplasia literally means without cartilage formation, around 250,000 individuals worldwide. 80% of those are spontaneous and they can be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. And here you can see the nature publication of the uh, found mutation in the FGFR3 mutation. Uh, specific spine pathology encountered in achondroplasia can, uh, is significant for frame and magnum stenosis, so uh, infants are usually screened for sleep apnea or things like that. Um, they all start out with thoracolumbar kyphosis and eventually walk out of that uh, with a minority presenting later in life with uh, deformity. You can see in the middle here, they have lumbosacral hyperlordosis from their excessively tilted pelvis. And then, uh, like in our case, uh, global or focal spinal stenosis. Here's some uh, publications that show the rate of symptomatic stenosis up to 90% in some studies and the rates of surgical intervention up to 25%, usually uh, after 20 years old. This is what I believe is the basis for this entire systematic review, and I believe this is the first publication showing a detailed significant event timeline in achondroplasia. So we start in 1878 where the term achondroplasia was first described, uh, progressing to the first case report of paraplegia all the way to 1925 where the first autopsy reports even detail uh, what was going on in the achondroplastic spine. Um, so that was the first time that it was actually described having uh, stenosis. In 1926, the first laminectomy was performed. In 49, uh, it was formally recommended that laminectomy be uh, uh, sought after for patients with spinal stenosis and achondroplasia. In 1965, the characteristic narrowed interparticular distance was described in Nature. In 72 and 77, you have classification systems describing the stenosing syndromes, which were later uh, abandoned. In 1980, you have the first case series and the first time CT scan was used to uh, diagnose stenosis in these patients. In 1983, because of the difficulties with lumbar puncture, uh, they recommended C12 uh, my puncture for myelography. In 1984, they recommended using SSEP monitoring. <clears throat> In 87, they have the first, another case series with long-term outcomes. And then really the, 
the modern era takes place in 1988, where you have uh, Street and publishing his extended laminectomy technique over multiple levels, evaluating bladder dysfunction and using MRI to diagnose spinal stenosis. And this also happens to be the same year that Tolo described the first successful pedicle screw instrumentation in the thoracolumbar spine. Uh, prior to this, it was relatively contraindicated to use any posterior fixation because even passing a sublaminar wire or a laminar hook was associated with significant drop and SSEPs. So uh, basically anterior surgery was the uh, uh, mainstay for these types of patients other than just a laminectomy. And then in 1994, the, the uh, FGFR3 mutation was described. And at the bottom, you can see how the, uh, the diagnosis was made, everything from just pure physical exam localization of the uh, lesions all the way to currently using CT scans and MRIs. And so for our PRISMA search, based on that timeline, we wanted to know the surgical, what are the surgical outcomes and complications associated with spinal stenosis surgery and achondroplasia. So we searched three databases, and there's our inclusion and exclusion criteria. We excluded any report detailing other types of skeletal dysplasias and uh, non-thoracolumbar spinal stenosis. And because pedicle screw instrumentation is kind of the modern, uh, what everybody is using, um, we excluded publications prior to 1989. And so that left us with 11 total studies. <clears throat> Here you can see a summary of the included publications in the cohort years. And here's the results from that. Um, you can see that uh, over the timeline that there is about 80% adult uh, patients in the 442 that we uh, report on with derotomy rates being extremely high, zero to 45%, and uh, revision rates somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 18 to 100% of patients undergoing surgery. Surgical technique uh, started off uh, early on with just laminectomy as I shown on the timeline and eventually progressed to 100% fusion rates uh, in uh, later cohorts. The neurologic uh, recovery was uh, kind of <clears throat> all over the place. Um, most pe people just reported anecdotally on improved symptoms or quote unquote calling them cured, uh, which is difficult to interpret. But um, uh, needless to say, there was a lack of patient reported outcomes in, in most of these studies and uh, things like Asia grading or, or Frankel grading or anything like that aren't really reported. So when we summarize our results, we had 11 studies. Uh, important to note that 82% of these came from a single American institute and 18% came from a non-American institute. Uh, comprised of level three and level two evidence. Uh, 442 individuals, 79% uh, were adult. However, because multiple of these studies came from one single American Institute, it's hard to determine if there are 442 individualized cases or if there's significant overlap in their uh, reporting. Uh, the range of publications was 2000 to 2014, and you can see the uh, previously reported results there. So this is the first PRISMA review of thoracolumbar spinal stenosis and achondroplasia. Uh, there are other narrative reviews, but none of them follow the PRISMA criteria. Uh, and this is the first one that uses a significant surgical advancement timeline to inform our systematic review. Uh, no definitive statements can uh, uh, be made, but derotomy rate and revision rates remained high across all the studies, and that's similar to the prior to 1988 uh, publication uh, case series. And neurologic recovery seemed consistent across studies, but very informal reporting and patient reported outcomes were rarely used. So our strengths were that we did not combine the pure stenosis with uh, deformity correction or frame and magnum stenosis. We used purely thoracolumbar stenosis uh, when we could uh, account for it, and we based it on the surgical timeline. Limitations, there were very small sample sizes, uh, less than 500 total patients. Five out of the 11 publications, although we tried to uh, only include patients after 1989, uh, but five out of 11 did have sampling prior to that. Um, so we did not, uh, some of the studies did not include how they diagnosed the stenosis, which uh, seems important. And then uh, all studies came from two centers and we can't uh, guarantee that there wasn't overlap within these patient cohorts. Future research could benefit from describing the fusion rates, patient reported outcomes, uh, assessing the revision rates of all fusion cohorts, and then uh, having multi-center uh, studies with possibly mixed deformity in the uh, equation. So what was the surgical plan for our patient? Our patient got a CT and MRI of their cervical spine and got cleared prior to surgery. 
We did a T4 to pelvis instrument infusion with uh, wide decompression and a complex dural reconstruction for our anticipated dural erosion and deficiency from that large overgrown facet. And here you can see uh, the uh, outcome here. Uh, one thing to note, if you can look in the middle here, Patients have the classic champagne flute or wide pelvis with high arching sciatic notches. So one thing to be aware of that the, uh, the pelvis screws, if you're gonna uh, place iliac bolts are very horizontal and uh, are different than your typical trajectory. So that's something to be aware of. Also, you can see very short screws. Um, patients with achondroplasia have typically uh, 10 millimeter pedicle lengths compared to normal 20 to 25. Uh, so we had to account for that. Um, and then we skipped a few levels and used uh, hooks or uh, varied our implant density based on the uh, uh, dysplastic nature of some of the pedicles. And four month post-op, the patient is again walking with trekking poles, no longer using a walker, still has improvements in their numbness and tingling, but still has some in their feet. They have improved strength, but still recovering, but they do have uh, bowel and bladder control that's intact. And with that, I'll take some questions. Great. Uh, can you go back to the uh, post-surgical slide with that? Yeah, so this is really nice. First of all, applause. I really appreciate how you picked up uh, on a very specific topic. In your review of uh, these studies, with a great caveat being a high likelihood of patient overlap uh, due to the few centers of origin, what did they? What was the length of follow-up and did they describe post-laminectomy kyphoses as being a problem? Uh, some of the um, studies did look into post-laminectomy kyphosis. Uh, however, most of the revisions in these cases we're describing repeat stenosis or neurologic issues. Some of the studies um, did describe the thoracic or thoracolumbar kyphosis uh, on initial presentation, and those were more likely to get an anterior base surgery and a posterior decompression. Uh, in our presentation here, we specifically tried to exclude those patients so that we could get a pure spinal stenosis look. But obviously, um, all cases are on a spectrum. Some may have more kyphosis than others. This patient actually did not have any thoracolumbar kyphosis. Great answer. And again, length of follow-up, you didn't answer that. Do we yeah. have a length of follow-up kind of a, a delta a graph? Yeah. And so the length of follow-up was generally over a year, but it ranged everything from 18 years in some patients where they just kept coming back to the same center. Uh, and then some were just completely lost to follow-up at three to six months. So it's, it's very hard to interpret some of these uh, wide-ranging uh, follow-ups. Dr. Hart, you, uh, in anticipation, took the microphone. ISSG is one of the leading institutions around the world or organizations that has uh, followed deformity. Do standard deformity parameters apply for achondroplastic patients? Well, they're, they're clearly outliers, and I think, uh, you know, this, these x-rays speak to that. I mean, that, that uh, um, pelvic anatomy is, is obviously uh, at one end of uh, the spectrum of normal, so. I, uh, this is a great contribution. It's a very challenging patient population. I've really only had a, a, a handful of patients over the years with achondroplasia that I've taken care of. And I wanted to call out, I'm uh, glad to see Michael Ains' name up there and have him getting uh, recognition for the contributions he's made both clinically and with respect to research in this patient population, very critical. Uh, and the last thing I guess I'd add is the word uh, cure, if it appears in spinal literature, needs to have an asterisk next to it. And the asterisk needs to say, for the time being. And um, I'm reminded of uh, the joke that's not, not, uh, not related to achondroplasia, but the last words of a herniated fragment as it's removed by the surgeon. I'll be back. All right. Rod, any comments on achondroplasia? I mean, I like that timeline slide a lot. That was like a brilliant idea of yours to actually plot that out like this and show how we're evolving over time in our insights. I think it's a great project um, because there's very little known about it. And, you know, it's not a huge population, but when you deal with these patients, it's not just the lumbar spine. Is you know, you found out it's thoracic, there's cervical. So it's a complicated problem. Yeah. Great job, Jerry. I mean, I, I personally can't think about going back to pure decompressions. I tried that in a couple of patients. I tried to preserve 
uh, uh, mobility, as you all know, wherever possible. And uh, you can't do an adequate job with decompressions only. These patients routinely kyphose or do something that I don't anticipate from other non-affected patients. So uh, for me, a fusion while a radical uh, uh, response is a really big uh, uh, game changer in terms of having a controlled environment and a very comprehensive neurologic decompression. And I don't say that willy-nilly. It's a, it's a big deal decision. But thank you for your contribution. Great work. We'll go back to infections. Um, and uh, Dr. Jonathan Plum was not introduced, but you saw him in some of the introduction slides. He's uh, one of our wonderful research fellows. He's from Germany, from the largest trauma center in Europe, uh, in Bochum, Germany, in a northern German industrial complex area. And it's the oldest trauma center in the world. Uh, it's actually uh, going back to 1863 or something like that. And Professor Wilhelm Röntgen, the famous Röntgen guy, actually had the first x-ray machine in the world in Bochum also, or the second one. I think it was the second one was in that trauma hospital that was created for sure minors. <laughs> so Dr. Plumer is a trauma surgeon, and he's not a sponsor surgeon, but uh, he has a strong interest in what we're doing with infections. And he took on a number of great projects. And one of them that we actually asked him to feature today is a profound importance. That is, what do we actually know about spinal hardware when we have a spinal infection, specifically a de novo infection, a out of nowhere infection of the spine? Is that safe? Are, there's a strong discrepancy, as he'll point out, between what our internists think and what we think we know. So let's see what we actually know, Jonathan. Yep, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you heard, my name is Johnson Plummer. I'm from Germany, Bochum, uh, ortho and trauma surgeon. And just to let you know, this is the hospital I'm usually working at. This is the universal hospital uh, in Bochum called Bergmannsheil. And you already said it, it's the oldest trauma hospital in the world and one of the largest in Europe. I just uh, give you a short idea what I'm presenting today. I'm, it's a little unconventional. I'll start with the case presentation. And before we discuss the case, I will uh, go on with my systematic review and meta-analysis, and then we can maybe discuss the case at the end. So I'll start with a case. I'm presenting a 39-year-old male with osteoscitis T9 to 10 and epidural abscess from T8 to T10. He was uh, neuro neurologically intact when uh, he uh, entered the hospital, but then got worse over the night, ending up with a loss of function of the right lower extremity, severe weakness on the left side, and numbness with a uh, cumulative ASIA, ASIA score of 74. Um, yeah, the CT shows some erosion, and bony erosion of T9 and T10. And the MRI, sorry for the quality, it's not that good, but um, I mean, basically, the MRI showed an epidural abscess um, with compression of the spinal cord. So just think about your treatment plan. What would you do for this specific case? And then uh, maybe take some minutes for it, and I uh, go on with the systematic review I wrote on the uh, topic of is it safe to put hardware in spinal de novo spinal infections. So um, we're talk talking about spinal infection, and Nathan also uh, did this, and we can see that it's an increasing medical problem, uh, not only here in the US, but also in Europe. There is a recent, a recent publication uh, from France, which showed that the incidence doubled within nine years from 2010 to uh, 2019. Generally, uh, the recent publications focus on the outcome and, uh, yeah, of uh, surgical site infections, and there are only a few publications on the surgical uh, uh, treatment of the novo infections. And furthermore, uh, the use of hardware remains highly uh, disputed among physicians, and this is especially the case for ID doctors and ER doctors. So, and this, this is even the case for unstable spinal infections. And in, in addition, historically, the most de novo spinal infections are treated non-surgically. Uh, while surgery is uh, yeah, reserved for more severe cases like uh, neurological impairment or anti antibiotic failure or increasing uh, pain or increasing instability. So um, if we, uh, our, our systematic review, uh, with our systematic review, we wanted to show if surgical intervention and specially instrumented surgery for de novo spinal infections associated with higher rates of complications or adverse outcomes than non-instrumented or non-surgical therapy. 
And this is our, uh, basically our PICO table. We exclude surgical site infections, uh, TB uh, infections, uh, fungal infections, and studies without a clear comparison of surgical to non-surgical treatment or without a clear comparison of uh, instrumented to non-instrumented surgery. And additionally, the review was regi regi registered with PROSPERO, which is an international prospective register for systematic reviews. And on the bottom, you can see our search term. Yeah, um, this search revealed over 2,000 publications, uh, which were screened for the headlines and ended up in 120 abstracts we screened. And uh, all in all, 17 articles were included in the review. Let's take a look at our results. These 17 uh, studies included 2,069 patients, uh, and the mean age was 63 and 61% uh, of the patients were male. Uh, we built two comparison groups. And the first one was non-surgical to surgical treatment for the novel spinal infections, and the second group was instrument to non-instrumented surgery. And let's take a direct look to our meta-analysis. This is the meta-analysis uh, for uh, recurrence of infection. And it shows that there was no overall difference for odd ratios for instrument to non instrumented surgery. And there was also no difference between surgical and non surgical treatment in terms of recurrence of infection. Or we can also say that surgery, also including the instrumented surgery, showed no higher risk of re recurrence of infection compared to non surgical or non instrumented surgery. Uh, let's take a look at the reoperation rates in this case, instrumented versus non-instrumented surgery. Interestingly, we can see that the, that there is a significantly lower overall order ratio for instrumented uh, compared to non-instrumented surgery in terms of reoperation rates for the novel spinal infections. And uh, when we look at primary failure, which was defined as patients who need surgical debridement after surgical intervention before completion of the antibiotic treatment, for uncontrolled infection, we can see that there um, was no difference for the overall odd ratio for primary failure for instrumented compared to non-instrumented surgery. Another analysis towards um, the mortality rates for uh, surgery, and if we take a look at the, the first force plot, we can see that there was no difference in mortality in surgical versus non-surgical treatment. But, and that has to be emphasized, in the second forest plot, we can see that there is a significantly lower odd ratio for instrumented versus uh, non-instrumented surgery. We also looked for quality of life outcomes, uh, and this was uh, only possible for the com comparison of surgical to non-surgical treatment. And we could show that patients in the surgical group had a significantly uh, lower pain level than the non-surgical group. And this was measured by self-reported uh, visual analog scale and also with the SF36 questionnaire. There was another, another analysis towards the quality of life, and this uh, was on yeah, physical activity. And the surgical patients had a better self-reported physical activity compared to non-surgical patients. This was also measured with, SF, with the SF36 uh, questionnaire. So, so far, so good. Our limitations include the substantial heterogeneity of the included uh, studies. Uh, we were able, we were only able to include retrospective, uh, retrospective uh, studies. Um, this included then different healthcare systems and also different treat treatment techniques. But uh, or we also excluded non-pyogenic uh, fungal infections and TB and TB infections. But what is the conclusion according to the current knowledge based on the existing data for de novo spinal uh, infections? We could say that surgery for de novo spinal infections seems to be safe without, uh, without the higher risk of higher infection rate or mortality rates compared to non-surgical treatment and instrumented surgery compared to non-instrumented surgery showed lower reoperation rates and also lower mortality rates. And that's uh, also very important. Better outcomes seem to be possible with surgical treatment. So next step, we can take a look at our case. Maybe uh, maybe the review just changes uh, your opinion or the treatment plan, but uh, I can show you what we did in this case, in this specific case, which is um, that uh, we did a decompression from T5 uh, to T11 debridement. Uh, we put a Maybe that's controversial peak uh, cage in there. 
um, with bone graft and uh, did a yeah, segmental uh, fixation from T5 to, to L1. There was a positive culture for staph aureus, so the patient was uh, treated with vancomycin uh, and then changed to daptomycin, and on the later follow-up, he uh, received levofloxacin, um, which is also controversial, but maybe we can discuss this. And yeah, the follow-up was uh, quite nice. He was ambulating with a wheelchair, uh, sorry, with a walker. Um, he had a progressive uh, fusion, from uh, for the level T T9 to T10 and no recurrence of, in, of of the infection six months after the surgery. Yeah, any questions? Absolutely great job, thank you, Jonathan. So uh, I'm going to ask a facetious question. Um, what is the benefit of hardware? Why would we put hardware into an infected spine, a de novo infected spine? What's the purported benefit over just bracing a patient and cleaning out the infection with some washout? I mean, I think that the, the real benefit is the stability of the, uh, the uh, infection. And I think that's a big topic, I mean, and maybe an overlooked topic that stability is one of the main uh, things you want to achieve when there is a spinal stability. Also, uh, you want to be very meticulously when you do the debridement and you want to get out all the infected tissue. But I think the, the, the real uh, yeah, aspect of surgery is the stability. And I, I'd add to that alignment so you can realign the spine. Yeah, and I'd course. add to that further early mobilization to yeah. get people out of bed. Rod, has this yeah. uh, so nary a day goes by that an ID doctor doesn't ask us to take hard route or when we can take the hard route after a, a patient like this? Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of this is a practice changer and uh, why are we not uh, why are we still kind of having this discussion all these years later? Actually, this is very timely. I did a TB case last night, and the ID doc was very nervous about me putting hardware in uh, into a patient with TB. So it's 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 very relevant. Um, I think the two main things for me, Jonathan, if you could discuss, is is there a certain patient population? I know Nathan touched about. And then does the bug matter? So if it's TB, MRSA, can you can you comment on those two? I mean, we excluded TB here, but I mean, the, the actual path pathogen is very important too. And there's a lot of, uh, and there are a lot of patients who have MRSA. And I think it's also important to say that it's also a team approach or a team effort mm -hmm. that we, we need antibiotics. We cannot do a surgery and then leave the antibiotics away. I mean, that's a very, big topic too, so proper surgery, but uh, proper surgery is nothing without proper antibiotics. And uh, this all comes back to mm -hmm. identifying the, the, the pathogens. Yeah. So you think I'll be okay with the TB case last thing? <laughs> I think so, I hope you, so, but I mean TB is different TB from all blessing. the other pathogens. I mean, I work that much on TB, but it's uh, it can be challenging, Yeah, let's say. It. So do these patients, like does this man need to be on lifelong oral suppression antibiotics to prevent those little staph bacteria from marching along the hardware bone interface like little Pac-Man? You mean this case? Yeah. Uh, no, I would say no. Uh, you don't, uh, I would say, uh, you can go back to the, to the actual treatment. What's a little bit, uh, well, what you want to do is to, to prevent building of a biofilm, but you don't have to suppress for a uh, yeah, lifelong time. But because it wasn't proper to only use levofloxacin here in this case, maybe you could have added rifampicin for just, uh, yeah. To, to treat the biofilm build, building. But I mean, um, you don't have to suppress these patients for a lifelong time. Yeah. I wouldn't say no. Well, thank you for a great job. And you're here for another half year. So yep. we expect a uh, flurry of other very meaningful contributions. This alone will be very heavily quoted. I know that. And okay. I will certainly just send that reference to any ID doc who asks me the usual question of, can you take the hardware out? So thank you. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Zach Tatarin. He comes with a very interesting combo. If the camera would pan down to his legs, he has a unique uh, cool top uh, uh, bottom 
uh, um, kind of combo with scrubs on the bottom, Prada shoes on the very bottom, and a very nice looking professional uh, tie outfit. He has had a outstanding contribution in terms of picking up on very important things. And uh, one of those things is in deformity surgery, uh, what we actually really uh, should have looked for all this time. So Zach has done a tremendous job. He's from Ottawa, Canada, as I said, and he is uh, a super smart and tough guy. He's going to go to Boston. He's going to be here for another two or three months. So Zach, take us into this um, uh, in greater depth. I hadn't meant to conceal my scrub bottoms, but thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> um, Interest of transparency. I'm all Research. frazzled now. All right. Um, I have nine minutes, but this is a short, sweet, but simple talk. Um, so height gain following correction of adult spinal deformity. Um, I would say half the patients who come in asking about or presenting with the pathology requiring ultimately a large scale deformity correction often ask, doc, am I going to get taller? And the universal answer that I've seen has been everyone just says one to two inches. Um, and we sought to answer this question more thoroughly. So very commonly asked, um, it's really unknown if height gain is predictable or if it correlates with improvements in outcome, including satisfaction in appearance. Um, there've been, uh, or I'll get to that in the next slides. Um, but our hypothesis was that height gain following deformity correction is predictable. Um, just based on the nature of the surgery performed and the levels operated upon, and it correlates with improved patient satisfaction. Um, so there have been a couple of predictive studies. Uh, there's no cl clinical correlation in the studies um, that have been performed. Um, and traditionally, people will uh, count the number of fused vertebrae and the degrees of corrected Cobb angle and try to um, extrapolate uh, uh, kind of a, a target height gain afterwards, but typically everyone just has one to two inches. Um, so uh, all adult spinal deformity patients uh, had baseline and six week full body radiographic and patient recorded outcome measures data were included. Um, there were outcomes were compared from baseline to six weeks post-op. Um, and we used regression analysis to predict height change from T1 to S1 and S1 to ankle. So we kind of broke it down just based on um, which part of your body is getting taller. Um, so results, we had 198 patients, mean age was 57, average levels fused was 11.2. 74% um, of these patients gained height. Um, the average height gain, I was going to save it for the end, but is just under eight centimeters. So you're looking at just about on average a centimeter per level fuse. Um, so at six weeks, uh, sagittal and coronal alignment for patients improved significantly. You can see the pelvic tilt went from 25 to 21, PILL 14 to 3, SVA 60 to 17, all st statistically significant. And then I'll break it down in the next couple slides. But um, the average full body height gain was 7.5 centimeters. And then it's broken down in this picture just based on where they gained height. So somehow they gained 2.9 millimeters from their cell out of C2. Um, there was 3.8 centimeters from C2 to S1 and 3.3 centimeters from S1 to ankle. Um, so almost the same between T1 to S1 and S1 to ankle, which I wouldn't have predicted. I would have predicted it would have been most from T1 to S1, but about half the height gain is from your hip to your toes. Um, so um, height gain, T1 to S1, which is where I would have predicted most of the height gain would have come from, uh, it's statistically significantly correlated with thoracic Cobb angle corrections and maximum Cobb angle correction. And uh, trunk height gain correlated with improved SRS 22 appearance scores. And that's just a, a 20 patient or 20 question questionnaire um, scoli uh, patient reported outcomes, um, and it's robust and has been studied as extensively. So, um, T1 to S1 height change can be predicted using this complicated formula. Hopefully it can just be put into an app and you could just put in your thoracic Cobb angle and baseline T1 to S1 height. You would need robust standing, uh, full length radiographic films to achieve this. Um, not just the standing scully film you need from head to the toe. Um, and then from S1 to, or from 
S1 to ankle uh, correlated with a correction in pelvic tilt PI lumbar lordosis and SVA and height gain from T1 to ankle. So from your T1 to your ankle corrected with or correlated with correction in your pelvic tilt and your SVA. Um, and so if you, we had the equation from T1 to S1, the equation from S1 to ankle, similarly complicated. Um, and this is the formula. So uh, kind of as I mentioned before, height gain from S1 to ankle correlated with correction in pelvic tilt, PI, LL, and SVA. Um, and you can kind of, it kind of makes sense in that when you correct someone's spinal posture, they've been compensating by kind of bending their knees and adjusting a different posture from their hips to their toes. And then when you correct them, they no longer have to do this so they can stand up straighter. Um, and so in conclusion, I have two minutes left. Height gain following adult spinal deformity surgery is dependent on spinal deformity, how much you correct, and the length and the regions of correction. In our study, 11 segments fused, average 7.5 centimeter height gain, so just under a centimeter per level. Um, and there's algorithms, so you can now predict that predictably if you were so inclined. If someone wanted to know exactly how much taller they wanted, we're going to get. Zach, I want to really congratulate you on this. This is nothing short of brilliant. Uh, there have been 15 years of uh, uh, investigations on spinal. No, I mean, it's spinal alignment and this uh, uh, angle and that angle and ratio. And here with one simple question, you basically uncovered a combination of how these angles um, tie in together and uh, what ramifications they have on our compensatory mechanisms, like a lower extremities. I really uh, uh, commend you on how you did this and how you kind of uh, turned a simple question to something meaningful. Is there a benefit in your estimation by disimpacting the torso of pulmonary function and uh, uh, body uh, mass index slash uh, weight uh, gain um, or weight loss? Uh, I think dramatically, I didn't really focus on it in this paper, but um, I fit, what, what's exactly your question? Pulmonary does, function? Does this impaction of the trunk yeah. relate to measurable uh, uh, parameters like pulmonary function? That's a good uh, question for future studies. Yeah. I haven't, it's not been shown before. I haven't. That's, that's my next project right there. Okay. Um, but uh, you can kind of see in this pre-op and post-op just... Uh, coronal views, just kind of the the hip and knee compensatory mechanisms that they're exhibiting pre-op and post-op, how they're kind of straighter and taller in their lower extremities. I thought that was kind of interesting. I would have predicted it would have been all from the torque, like from your hips up. That's where the height gain would have come from. But That's a French paper. French paper. Right. Yep. Gossier, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Hart, you've kind of been the mentor for this paper. Stay with that image. No, maybe. It's a cool one. Or one of the other ones, the, the graphs. Dr. Hart, you, you mentored this and you've obviously been instrumentally involved, uh, pun intended, with the ISSG. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I, uh, I would echo, uh, you know, I, I think I've said uh, publicly elsewhere. I mean, I think this was a really a, a brilliant um, question. And, uh, you know, for, I've, I've talked before, and I, I don't know if I've said it uh, with this group of fellows or not, but uh, research questions, you want to you want to look for a question that is unanswered, which this was. You want to look for a question that has clinical importance to patients, which this does. And then you also want to test, can you, do you have a mechanism by which to develop uh, sufficient data to answer the question? And we did here, and I want to acknowledge ISSG, uh, the researchers and surgeons within that group. Uh, really, this was an analysis within that database. Uh, and then the last part of the question is, is it important to you? Is it important enough to you to finish uh, the work? Because it takes a long time to slog through all of the preparation and creation and writing of the paper. And ultimately, if you don't put this out there, it has no impact. So. Um, I want to congratulate all of the fellows uh, in that regard. These were just five really, six really fantastic uh, papers, and you guys have done a great amount of work. Uh, and if I, I don't know if it's the last word, but somebody here needs to acknowledge Dr. Chapman's uh, role as research mentor and, uh, and in his typical inimitable way, 
uh, keeping you guys uh, on task and uh, through to completion of uh, some very important projects. So I wanted to acknowledge Jens today as well. May I ask the fellows to come up front uh, for one picture and uh, all those six great presenters. And uh, again, thank you for your hard work and showing up early in the mornings and uh, late in the evenings. And maybe I'll ask Lindsay to come up front also because this would not happen without her working so hard. So thank you to our audience around the world. We had a great uh, uh, presence and uh, congratulations to our fellows and may they go on to greater uh, impact on spine care around the world.